right. Well, welcome back, everybody, to BuildCast and our special series, The Road Home, Understanding the Paths to and From Homelessness. You did it. I did it. All right. <laughs> one sentence. So we're really excited to be here. Thank you, everybody, for uh, for watching. With me, as always, I've got my good friend Natalie with Social Strategies and, of course, Melissa with Homemade Austin. So today we are going to be talking about the lack of affordable health care. Who are we talking to today, Melissa? Well, two fabulous people who I can appreciate who have very long names and very <laughs> long titles. I want to see you <laughs> I know, for them. In the tone. As somebody with a long name, I appreciate a good long name. So first we have Mike Stif Stefano. Oh, gosh. Can we Sorry. start that over? Yeah. <laughs> yes. <Stephanie. laughs> see, I there like you how go. Mike's like, I knew it. Gosh, dang it. Seeking it exactly. That's what's what You're happened. You're my so. cheeks hurt. I know. Okay. <laughs> I was like, ow. All right. So oh, should God. I just talk about how I'm excited and they have long names and then we'll go into their long names? Yeah. Stefanovich. Okay. We have with us today Mike Stefanovich, who is the Director of Sexual Health for Community Care. These are two people with very long names and very long titles. <laughs> I can appreciate that as somebody with a very long name myself. That was a beautiful first pronunciation. You did great. Thank you. Yes. Nailed it. Great. First you did. time. You did. Right out of the gates. And then we have Keegan Warren Clem, who is the Director of People's Medical Legal Partnership. So welcome, welcome. to the two of welcome. you. And thank you so much for being a part of our conversation about the lack of affordable healthcare. I'd love to hear uh, your journey, how you ended up uh, in the roles you're in and what those roles have meant to you. Keegan, we'll kick it off with you. All right. Yeah. So I'm actually an attorney uh, and healthcare uh -oh. provider. I know, right? You're all in trouble now. <laughs> um, <Got> coverage. No. <laughs> I work with patients um, alongside other clinicians, alongside social workers and nutritionists and, and um, just a plethora of people. We do truly human centered care. The idea, I mean, part of what, what healthcare is struggling with right now is how do we address the ways where we live, grow, work, play, and age affect our health, right? Because what we know, what studies are sh telling us is that 20% of our overall health and wellness is clinical care, right? It's hugely important. But that that other 80% is taking place outside the walls of our clinics and our hospitals. And if that's the case, then the part of what we need to do in the delivery of healthcare is bring those spaces and bring experts in those spaces in particular into uh, the, the point of service. And so that's what I do. I oversee attorneys who are able to assist with um, health-related social needs. So let me give you an example, if I might. Um, imagine a child with asthma. So traditionally, that child would be treated with steroids, with inhalers, would be seen both a primary care physician and a specialist. Uh, we would predict that they'd still end up in the emergency department, that their educational attainment at school would be interrupted, that mom and dad's ability to get to work would be interrupted, right? There's all these consequences that come from a diagnosis like asthma. In medical legal partnership, uh, we don't just focus on that biomedical response, right? So the other thing that we're doing is asking mom and dad, uh, what's going on at home? Is there mold or mildew that your landlord won't help clean up, for instance? And with, by having attorneys as part of the healthcare team, we can empower tenants, um, empower that asthmatic patient to be able to have healthy housing uh, and do so in a way that actually can remediate the asthma um, potentially more effectively um, than uh, just treating the symptoms, right? Because because we're treating the disease. We're treating that the pre cause. preventative right. healthcare is so important. Mm -hmm. And what about you, Mike? So uh, my name is Mike Stefanovich. I'm a physician uh, at Community Care, Federally Qualified Health Centers. Um, and for those who aren't familiar with community care, uh, we're really a compendium of different clinics um, under one federally qualified, uh, one umbrella of federally qualified health centers. Uh, we have a, about almost three dozen clinics now across Austin Travis County. Uh, we're very close cousins to People's Community Clinic in the sense that we serve very similar patient populations. Um, you know, we serve a lot of medically and socially vulnerable and marginalized men, women, children, and families, those oftentimes living at or below the federal poverty line, um, those who are unstably housed, unhoused, or marginally housed. Um, and we, we serve a lot of individuals, uh, a lot of people of color and a lot of individuals whose uh, primary language, primary spoken language is actually not English. 
And so um, within that very vast array and network of clinics, um, I actually have a smaller and occupy a smaller niche. Um, I'm a physician for our healthcare for the homeless team. I serve as one of a few different providers for our HCH team, healthcare for the homeless team for short. Um, and I'm also uh, a, uh, I also oversee the provision of all of our HIV, um, STI, and hepatitis C services for community care as well. So it's good to be here. Thank you for having me. Yeah, wow. you bet. Well, and fun fact, we partnered the, about this time last year with Community Care. We did a, here's some acronyms for you, a PPE drive with BMC. Oh, here we go. <laughs> and the HBA, <laughs> the Home Builders Association of Greater yeah. Austin. We all teamed up and DR Horton was also a part of this. Uh, the home builders came together. They had lots of masks and gloves. They had N95 masks. Oh, I remember this. Yeah. To come by. And so we did this on a national level. Each of our different markets, our different, our various affiliates partnered with BMC or whoever on the ground. And so, yeah, it was awesome. We were able to collect a ton of thousands of pieces worth of PPE and pass them along to community wow. care who then, you know, handed them out to uh, the other ones. Foundation okay. was a recipient. Okay. And among others. So yeah, so great to to finally meet you, Mike. And we do appreciate everything y'all are doing. Something we talk a lot about in our world at Homemade is that housing is healthcare. And that when you can get someone into safe and stable housing, you can drastically improve um, their well, their overall wellness and health care. And, and like you were talking about, Keegan, just focusing on that preventative health care. But I am interested to hear from y'all how you have seen the inverse, where you've seen health care being used as housing and how you are trying to help flip that conversation on its head. Whoever wants to take that, go for it. Uh, go ahead. No, sure. Happy to do so. And, um, you know, the, the concept of um, housing as healthcare, uh, I, I think for many people, it is still probably inappropriately so, but a, a still kind of a radical or novel concept. And so, you know, for me a, as a doctor, um, somebody who's, who's mostly spending day to day, you know, treating medical conditions, um, especially on our healthcare for the homeless side of things. Um, you know, it's important to start with the converse in mind, which is what we're talking about now. Um, and what that converse is, is what are the sequelae or what are the end outcomes in those who lack affordable housing, who lack access to affordable, stable housing? And when we talk about housing too, I mean, it's important to take a more global view of things. You know, um, you know, there are those who are unstably housed. There are those who are marginally housed. There are those who are doubling up on a couch. There are those who are re-entering from the criminal justice system and then there are those conceptually who we think of as you know street homeless. They're living in a tent or sleeping on a park bench or they're residing in shelters. And so um, you know the very definition of homelessness doesn't really you know it doesn't really capture the essence of what's going on in many people's lives. Um, right. It's important to get a little more granular. And so um, as a doctor, for those who for those of patients of mine who do not have access to affordable, stable housing and they are verifiably homeless, um, we see the outcomes there. I see them anecdotally, and I'll give you an anecdote. We see them very much objectively in the data too. Um, uh, Keegan had cited a study uh, that was published in the New England Journal of Medicine about, oh gosh, about 18 years back now, about how most of most of what happens in healthcare, most of patients, people's healthcare outcomes are not contingent on anything that I really do in clinic. About 20% of it is. Um, there was another really great study from Healthcare for the Homeless in Boston that followed patients or people experiencing homelessness for about 10 years. These are people on the streets with nowhere to go, maybe living in shelter, but really no stable opportunity for housing. Um, and what they found was those individuals actually died about 20 years sooner than their counterparts who were housed. Mm. And so here in the United States, the average wow. life expectancy for an individual is, is about the mid is about mid seventies. Um, and you know, if, if you're looking past this year with COVID and kind of how that skews some of the data, um, the average life expectancy for someone without a home, for someone living on the streets, is around 52, 51 years old in aggregate. And so lack of affordable housing manifests itself in every chronic condition that you or I could think of, diabetes, high blood pressure, uh, lung issues, but oh. exacerbated times 10, fuel, gasoline on the fire of any other chronic condition you could think of. And so for that reason, 
individuals without a home, um, and, and for all intents and purposes, I, I'm just going to refer to these people as people experiencing homelessness, even though it's a broad compendium of people. Um, these individuals tend to access healthcare services at a much higher rate than mm -hmm. their house counterparts. And so mm -hmm. they tend to be frequent flyers in the emergency room, namely our safety net hospitals here in Austin, Travis County, but it's a broader theme throughout the United States. And so these individuals tend to access emergency health care services more often. Um, as primary care. And as primary care, absolutely, mm -hmm. absolutely. Okay. And the last thing I'll say about it is um, these individuals, you know, most of what happens there, you know, and I, I love our colleagues in the acute care settings, but most of what happens there for these people is in no way therapeutic. You know, it's mm. they're temporizing measures. They give them a few days of prescriptions and they send them back on their way. And for individuals who are hospitalized, these individuals, by sheer nature of their homelessness, were actually hospitalized for a longer period of time compared to counterparts who are hospitalized for the identical condition, but who aren't experiencing homelessness. Mm -hmm. And that's because many times, you know, we don't want to discharge men, women, families to the streets after experiencing a chronic condition. For you or I or any of us who've been hospitalized before, you know, all you want to do after that is go home to the comfort of your own bed yeah. and recover in comfort. Makes sense. Um, and if you don't have the opportunity to do that, you know, one of the saddest things you'll ever see is a doctor or provider having to discharge somebody from their hospital bed to the streets. And if it feels intrinsically wrong, it's because it is. Mm -hmm. and, and, so and talk to us we, about we see that oftentimes is, is, you know, these individuals who have no other place to stay, um, they have protracted hospitalizations. They're there for a longer time because we're using the hospital as a temporizing measure for what is otherwise a poor substitute for housing. Right. And can you talk to us about recuperative care and what that means? Yeah, so, so recuperative care um, is it, something many of us are um, in homeless health care are actually very much passionate about. So recuperative care, um, and, and you may have heard other terms similar to it, uh, respite care, recuperative mm -hmm. care. Um, you know, some people may, may parse words, parse those terms a little differently. But in the broader sense, recuperative care is temporary housing, oftentimes, for individuals who are hospitalized or who are sufficiently ill that they should have a roof over their heads to feel, mm. to, to recover. So recuperative care is the idea of having um, a temporary place, whether, and this can, this is an umbrella term. So this could be, um, this could be a, a temporary clinic embedded or um, facility embedded within a homeless shelter. This could be a freestanding brick and mortar facility. They could be beds allocated at a nursing facility, specifically for individuals with unstable housing. Um, who are recovering from an acute medical condition. Um, great case in point. Um, time and time again, I'm, a, and I'm an ambulatory outpatient provider now, but uh, working in the hospital setting, we're, we discharge, un, unfortunately, for better or for worse, had to discharge patients to the streets given they had no other outcomes as far or no other places to go in terms of their disposition. And so many of these individuals, they're there for a flare of a chronic condition. And so they go, they go to the streets. The streets are no place for any individual to recover. Um, and they come back with a, rec with a recurrent episode of the same thing, utilizing, utilizing the healthcare system again and again and again. One, chron one um, example I'll give, where this is where recuperative care comes in, is you know, I had a patient who would come in time and time again at the hospital for an ac acutely decompensated diabetes. Um, they would come in with a, a recurrent foot ulcer and just out of control diabetes. Um, and this was actually back in Los Angeles when I was working there, mind you. Um, the opportunity to actually divert that patient for once to a recuperative care setting meant that for the few months after that, their diabetes was more stable. Their foot wound got better. Um, they were able to actually manage on their own, their chronic conditions. The only difference was they had a roof over their head and they had guaranteed meals every day. When people are in survival mode, when they are looking, you know, go back to Maslow's hierarchy of needs, psychology 101, um, when they are looking for a roof over their head, a safe place to sleep, when they are looking for food, shelter, safety, a bathroom, you know, then they are forced, they're in the unfortunate, uh, unfortunate uh, predicament where they are forced to choose between those essential elemental needs that are present today versus other healthcare needs tomorrow. And so recuperative care kind of takes that takes that out of the equation and gives people the resources that they need to recover from acute or chronic medical conditions in a safe, calm setting. 
Keegan, if you would, you know, let's back up a little bit and let's kind of frame it for people like myself. And, and I would imagine, you know, quite a few of our listeners that don't have a great perspective. How big of an issue is the lack of affordable health care? So it's actually, it's a really huge issue, especially in Texas. We are the state with the, the largest number of uninsured persons, whether we are talking about citizens or people who are uh, without documentation. Um, and so there's a lot of opportunity. One of the, the recent conversations that's been going on here is, um, you know, what is the appropriate way? What is the best way to get them uh, to get people health care that they need? Right. Because people are going to be sick and yeah. they're going to use our health care system, whether we give them insurance or not. Um, and I think that often uh, gets forgotten. And, and the, the examples that Mike gave are, are right on that point. Right. We can treat things downstream or we can start talking about how we get people um, to be able to address their health needs in an upstream sort of way. Mm -hmm. So the, the primary mechanism for doing that in the U.S. is insurance. And our health insurance functions largely the same as our car insurance, with the exception of we expect to be able to go to the doctor when we want to, and we never want to wreck our cars, right? <laughs> so we have three basic systems um, for accessing health care then. Uh, for those of us that are fortunate enough to be in professional positions, uh, we have our employer-sponsored insurance, which tends to be um, very generous um, and com and subsidized by our employers. There is another certain um, segment of the population that is uh, covered by governmental plans. And in particular, when we're talking about folks who are experiencing homelessness, uh, we tend to be talking about Medicaid. Um, Medicaid is broadly the insurance for poor people, but that's not all. Um, in a state like Texas, you must be low income with uh, limited resources and you uh, must be um, have been found disabled by the Social Security Administration under the eligibility requirements of the supplemental security income. Right. So it's a whole other program you have to navigate oh. and get through and then you become eligible for Medicaid. Um, alternatively, you could be below 14 or 17 percent of the uh, federal poverty line. So we're talking two or three hundred dollars a month, um, whether you're single or a family of four. Um, at, that, at that point, it's a really low amount um, and qualify for the Temporary Assistance for Needy Families program, which is, you know, before 1996, what we used to call welfare. Right. So then you become eligible for Medicaid. And then the other group who is um, eligible for Medicaid in broad numbers are those who are over the age of 65. Um, and so there is a misconception, I think, broadly about the availability of Medicaid for adults. Um, many people think that that if you're poor, Medicaid, that means you're eligible for Medicaid. Um, but that's not true in a state like Texas that didn't expand Medicaid under the Affordable Care Act. So is it those requirements or requirements specifically that Texas has, is that why our percentage is substantially higher uh, than other states? Yes. Sure, yeah. yeah. I mean, most most generally that is exactly why. We're, we're okay. at the federal floor uh, and not a step above it. Wow. And what's the current situation for children and coverage? I mean, I think a lot of people think that they're they're covered by programs like CHIP or through the government, but what's the reality for coverage when it comes to kids, Keegan? Yeah, um, kids actually do have a whole lot more options. Um, Medicaid um, has um, is a, is a available for children from the moment they're born up until they turn 18, right? So it really is um, restricted just to children. Now, the income limits on that vary. Um, depends on whether you're in that zero to one category, one to five, or six to 18. And so families can kind of float in and out of eligibility as their children age. Um, and then we do have CHIP, right? The Children's Health Insurance uh, Program, which is um, for people actually from conception uh, all the way up to age 19. So it's a little bit broader. It is uh, also has higher income limits uh, in terms of being eligible. And so it's kind of like an extended version of Medicaid, but that still only reaches children. And, and that's extraordinary, right? Half of all kiddos nationally are born um, through under Medicaid coverage. Wow. So it's this is a really that. Yeah. important program for children. Wow. Yeah. Yeah. No doubt. Mike, I've got a question for you. So you talked a lot about how uh, you know the homeless are substantial, I think you said 10 times more likely to use or they use 10 times the services as you know those of us with homes 
medical services, are there typical things that you see most often that they're coming in for? Um, mm. Expand on that a little bit, if you could. Sure, happy to do so. Um, you know, I, I think it is, you know, when, you know, when the average person I'm talking to who is who is housed and, and homelessness is not something that is really uh, a pervasive element of what they have to think about day to day. Sure. Um, you know, when they think of somebody who is kind of the prototypical individual experiencing homelessness, they think of somebody who is struggling with concurrent uh, mental health issues, substance use, um, and you know, by and to some degree, you know, um, mental he mental health issues and substance use are a little more pervasive amongst mm. individuals experiencing homelessness, but really most of the health issues that, that many of the health issues we see both on the acute setting and what walks into clinic day to day are really the same chronic conditions that any, any, any of us would have, those of us who are, who are, have a permanent stable housing situation, sure. um, things like diabetes, things like COPD, um, you know, cardiovascular disease, um, sexually transmitted infections, hepatitis. And so many of these things are pervasive throughout American society. The difference is though, that individuals experiencing homelessness classically, both anecdotally and objectively, based on what we know in the literature, are, are more inclined to get care later on. And when they present with a specific clinical condition like diabetes or high blood pressure or heart disease, it's likely to be more advanced. If you look at the top causes of death here in the United States, again, pre-COVID, um, you'll see that the top causes of death for the average American are heart disease and cancer. Um, that same study that I cited actually from Boston Healthcare for the Homeless, the top causes of death, um, the number one cause of death was actually overdose related to substance abuse, but numbers two and three were actually heart disease and cancer. Um, and actually what's very surprising is that um, many of those individuals with cancer were younger individuals actually. Mm -hmm. And so, and, and many of those um, episodes of cancer are actually lung cancer, just given the higher incidence of tobacco use and smoking in people experiencing homelessness. And so again, it's a lot of the same conditions that we would see bread and butter in primary care or in the hospital, but exacerbated and amplified times 10. And then um, I, I would be remiss if, and I, I know you guys had uh, featured Dr. Dr. Ashley Trust on here before with yes. animal care as well. Mm -hmm. um, and so she could speak to it and she had spoken to it so much more eloquently than I, but um, a big a significant unmet need here in Austin and really in any major metro area for people experiencing homelessness is a more robust healthcare safety net uh, for yeah. mental health services specifically. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Mental health services and acute emergency mental health care yeah. services. How do we get there? I know that's that's not an easy <laughs> question, but would love to hear both of your thoughts on on, you know, is it just education? Is it what is it? What 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 is it going to take? <laughs> Mike's looking at me going, you take that one. <laughs> <laughs> it, They're both still <laughs> taking a moment with that. Yeah. <laughs> solve, solve the world. Yeah. Um, mm, yeah, that's so, what we're here for, you know? Yeah. <laughs> right. <laughs> oh, okay. Well, no, no pressure. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. So I think that... I'm sorry. I'm going to need the prompt again, actually. <laughs> no. It, oh, uh, yeah, no problem at all. So yeah, so so tell us. Okay, so how do we solve that problem? And I don't. And, and Mike, you might want to rephrase oh. your last sentence if you did. If you can, oh, okay. if you remember so, it. No, no. I, I mean, this is helpful for me to understand. Yeah. Too, you know. So that I mean, it, it sounds like the question is how 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 do we solve the problem of a of afraid healthcare safety net? Correct. Correct. Okay. Yes, sir. Around mental health. Oh, specifically Correct. around yeah. mental health. Yeah. Gotcha. Gotcha. Okay. okay. Um, you know, th this is a question that I think Dr. Trust could speak to and probably did speak mm -hmm. to more eloquently than I, but, you know, I think it goes back to, it goes back to just the provision of more essential healthcare services, sure. both locally and at the state level and, and, ma and making the eligibility criteria uh, a little more lax for those individuals. I think sure. um, Keegan will certainly speak better than I to the need for expanded uh, access to expanded Medicaid coverage here. When it comes to mental health services, I mean, we really just need more boots on the ground in terms of available healthcare providers. Mm -hmm. You know, many of the providers who care for people experiencing homelessness specifically, um, it, we do have a higher incidence of 
acute and chronic mental health needs. Mm -hmm. um, but it, it, like many things as it relates to the healthcare safety net, it boils down to funding and availability of boots yeah. on the ground, mm -hmm. psychiatrists, mental health professionals. Um, but the problem is so much more pervasive than that. Um, individuals experiencing homelessness experience trauma at a, at a rate that is nearly tenfold higher than the right. average individual who is housed. And so it really speaks to you know, Keegan's uh, kind of clarion call for upstream services. So housing stability, affordable housing to really re to re really render the provision of these other services a little bit more of a moot point um, so that patients and individuals who are experiencing homelessness are not traumatized and re-traumatized time and time again. They're not receiving episodic, fragmented care. Um, mental health care is primary care. And, you know, I, I can't speak to mental health care in a compartmentalized fashion um, because I think we really need to speak more so to building a more robust primary care health system. Um, and yeah, I think that's all I have to say about that. And, you know, it feels like you have to make a choice sometimes. And we talked about having kids mm -hmm. and really waiting it out. You know, I mean, even I, I have lots of resources and I have the wealth to be able to take my kids to the doctor, but, you know, my daughter broke her arm last summer and we took her in and she got taken care of. And then like a few months after she got the cast off, she fell off her bike again and she said her arm was broken again. And I was like, well, let's just see if this swells up. <laughs> like, let's just, because that was $2,000. Let's just wait it out. And, you know, my husband ended up taking her in and it was, you know, close to a thousand dollars to find out she had nurse's elbow. But I mean, is it that healthcare has become such a luxury just from price alone? And then where do you find the lineup of things that like, is it that people give up on healthcare first and then it's housing and then food is usually the last thing that they lose touch with Keegan? I think that's right. Right. I think um, it's easy to prioritize um, food when we're hungry. Right? Mm -hmm. We're getting yeah. signals kind of constantly that we're, that it's time to eat. Um, so I think I think that's right. And I think that when you are having to shift your budget, you're having to make decisions about um, which of the essentials you can access on any given day, health care, uh, it's true with legal services as well, mm -hmm. um, falls by the wayside until it is so acute, uh, so critical that you must get uh, assistance, mm -hmm. um, then you do mode. that. But, yeah. but then, right. yeah, then you're in crisis mode and mm -hmm. your outcomes are going to be worse. The treatment you need is more expensive. Um, and, and I think that is pervasive, I think, throughout our healthcare system. And it seems to only exacerbate the stigma, right, of sure. like mental health and, um, you know, like chronic health issues. Like, because if we could get to the point where people were treating mental health like you would you know, going to the dentist or right. something like that. Like it was a normal Annual part. checkup. <laughs> right. Rather than only treating it when it's, you know, just at this absolute crisis point. I mean, it seems like. Yeah. And I'd like to point out, Mike, you made a point and um, we've heard this not only from Dr. Truss, but from almost every guest during uh, the last five, five tapings. And in that boots on the ground. So if I'm experiencing homelessness and I've already got chip stacked against me. Um, the fact that I might have a medical issue, much less a mental health issue. How am I getting to you? Right. Yeah. I don't even have transportation yeah. to get to you. When I get to you, let's say it's not uh, a provider who does who accepts someone without identification. They, we're continuing to stack against um, those experiencing homelessness because of a lack of boots on the ground, like you and said. Advocates and yeah, right. I'm trying to navigate not the system is there. not simple, not, even right. for, for you know those of yeah. us that are housed, right. you know, much less not. It's yeah, that's a that's a good point. And like Although you know, I, the, I with the say, I, 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 the one thing I will say to that is because um, the last thing I want to do is is leave this podcast advocating for more copies of me. Um, <laughs> it, you know, we, we do need more the provision of more mental health services and, yeah. and mental health professionals, but you know. Just like Keegan had said, you know, what's what's not needed is, is boots on the ground in terms of more necessarily doctors or or caseworkers or social workers. And people may disagree with me on that. Um, that may be a bit of a controversial statement. Um, you know, I you may hear this in uh, this term before, but you know, we really do have for our help people experiencing homelessness a social services industrial complex. 
you know, you may have heard this term with the prison industrial complex. And, and, and this is, this is a, uh, patients are very perceptive about this. They feel like they see me, they see our social worker, they see a caseworker, um, and then they go back and forth and back and forth. Mm. And they're telling the same stories again mm. and again and again. Okay. And they feel like they don't really get anywhere. And so, you know, when it comes to, if, if we had one, one area to actually target funding and actually one, one area of need, greatest need is really those upstream services. And, and housing is that upstream service because really, I'm not an, I'm not the most essential element of their care, neither is our case manager or our social worker or our nurse. The most essential element that's going to keep them out of the hospital later on and that's going to keep them healthy and that's going to narrow that life expectancy gap between them and their house counterpart is a permanent roof over their head. Well put. Very yeah. well put. Yeah, I agree. Yeah. Well, Keegan, how about you? Any, uh, any we're just about out of time. What... Uh, any final comments? What do you feel the most important thing that our uh, our viewers and listeners should know? Mm. Well, that's that's a small question. Can we have another? Hour? <laughs> <laughs> I, I have always hour. ask very small questions. I do this every time. <laughs> <laughs> I just give yeah. you a blank canvas. Let's look at it that way. <laughs> um, you know, I actually I want to talk a, a touch on I think this notion of mental health. Um, and and the system that is available, because I think um, that it's very clear that we don't have enough mental health practitioners, and we could certainly get into the way our residency programs are structured and why that's true in terms of, of there being a disincentive uh, for um, MDs to go into psychiatry. But I think going back to this idea of the upstream and and thinking about this, um, the various industrial complexes that exist, um, thinking about our our third sector, we really gutted mental health services um, probably 50, 70 years ago, and we haven't done a good job of compensating for that. And so um, so people do end up homeless. They do end up jailed. Uh, and those are where the mental health care is being provided instead of in a stable environment. Um, and so this, yeah, so I think that's, that's that would be my um, yeah. final observation. Well, I was kind of surprised to see we were uh, pretty much uh, at time, and that was uh, a good 10 minutes ago. So again, I'm, I'm sure as these conversations always go, they could go for another hour, but uh, we certainly appreciate you guys coming in and talking to us and helping us. You know, really, you know, I started off very early in this series, you know, made it clear that I'm ignorant on most of these things, you know, and this has been such a tremendous learning experience for me. So um, really honored to have you both on uh, the podcast with us. And we certainly thank you for your time. Yeah. Thank you for fighting the yes. good fight and for being yes. on the front yes. lines. Thank you so much for everything. Keep you going. <laughs> thank you for having us. Thank, thank you. you very much. All right. Take care, everybody.